Welcome to this week's edition of Black Authors Matter TV, where we interview the latest movers and shakers in the African-American literary community. You'll meet some old friends, discover new ones, and stay abreast of the latest book developments around the country and even the world. So sit back and relax for the next two hours with Black Authors Matter TV co-hosts, Gwen Richardson and Dr. Rhonda Lawson. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Black Authors Matter TV. It is April 4th, and we apologize. We are three minutes late. I hate to be late. We had some kind of technical glitch going on, and um, it's fixed. We couldn't go live, so we had to start over, and thank goodness it went live. We do a test every week to make sure everything's working so we don't have this issue. So anyway, we're here, and we're excited about tonight because we have a great group of guests and we also are announcing our finalists for the Black Authors Matter TV Awards at the end of the show. I didn't introduce myself. I'm Gwen Richardson, your host for tonight, along with my co-host who needs to unmute. You need to unmute, Rhonda. I'm sorry. <laughs> After we came back on. Um, yeah, I'm glad it worked the second time because I was like, no, 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 no. So what we are going to do, we have a lot going on tonight and yeah. we have our first guest in the waiting room. I do want to announce that we're giving away some books. So we're going to give away the books at the end of the first interview since we're late. But we have the amazing Tanana Reed Dude tonight and this is her new book that we're going to be giving away. Then we have three copies of Mary Monroe's book from last week. She donated their autograph. So anyway, our first guest is Tamika Fryer Brown. She's a children's author. She's been on the show before. And she has two new books that she's done um, that came out in the last several months. So she's going to talk about both books. And then she, we lost her while she was coming on. So while she's coming on, she, she has to log back in, I guess. Um, I'll make a couple of announcements while she's logging back in. The National Black Book Festival author registrations were out of the early bird stage. We're in standard uh, registration. We were 70% booked. So just keep that in mind. If you still want to attend, it's, it's going to be a great event. It's going to sell out. So Tamika, I'm glad you logged back in. We had a, oh, she's gone again. Okay. So <laughs> anyway, I don't know what's causing that. All right. It's always something. But um, there she is again. We're gonna hopefully it will work this time. And so Tamika's books are some of them are um, they're very culturally specific, but some of them are also uh, historical in nature. So Tamika. You, okay, okay yeah, you got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're not, you're not just teasing us, are you? Are you going to leave us again? Yeah, I'm not leaving again. I, I was clicking. I was thinking I was clicking the thing that said, you know, you're accepting that it's being recorded. And I clicked that and I would just keep clicking and I just kept clicking myself out. How are you, <laughs> How are you all doing this evening? <laughs> we are great. We had a technical problem at the top because we always like to come on exactly seven. So we, we yeah. were like three minutes late, which we 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 never that never happens. But sometimes it, things happen. We had to actually start over. We had to close the Zoom and everything and yeah. start over because we couldn't get it to go live stream. So anyway, Tamika, welcome back to the show, and congratulations on your two books that you published since you were here last. Thank One you. of them focuses on Shirley Chisholm. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, awesome. and the other one is called um, That Flag. Is it That Flag? Yeah. Correct. Correct. So do you have copies of your books with you? I do. You know, I have them sitting right here. I know. I thought you would. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is uh, Not Done Yet, Shirley Chisholm's Fight for Change. Love and, it. Uh, of course, this is about the phenomenal Shirley Chisholm. And it's a picture book written for the youngest readers because it's okay. a poem, a narrative okay. free verse poem. And we focus on um, her fighting spirit, how she's always had it, and how that translated to her finding her destiny, you know, in a really unique way. So that's that one. 
Okay. And this is That Flag. Okay. And it's about best friends, Kira and Bianca, who end up divided over the meaning and significance of the Confederate flag. That's a yeah. pretty heavy topic for a children. Yeah. How did you attack that? Um, well, the fact that uh, I used the friendship structure mm -hmm. was really what allowed me to, um, I think, be able to pull off writing it for a younger, younger age group. Right. Um, yeah, so we talking about, we're talking about the emotional impact of things like the Confederate flag. And, um, and so just having that friendship structure and dynamic and using um, language and situations that kids could relate to, um, you know, that's the way I went about it. I will say this, that um, if you're able to break this type of conversation down so children can respect each other and have a real conversation about it, that may be a great example for adults to be able to do the same thing. Because yeah. adults, you know, we get very polarizing on certain subjects. So if you're able to break this down for kids to understand, this could be something great for adults. I'm glad you said that because that is the feedback that I've been getting. Wonderful. Um, I've been uh, hearing from educators, library specialists, and parents. And they're all saying that same thing. One, that it is allowing them to um, have a conversation with their children and that the children can understand it in ways that they may not have been able to understand it before. And then I got adults saying that um, it made them cry. It impacted them. They wish they'd had it when they were young. Somebody said it, it wasn't until they were in college that they were able to transform their thinking because they hadn't been exposed to any other information besides what they had been being fed, um, which was not grounded in like the true real meaning of the Confederate flag. So yeah, I'm hearing that this is a book from not only the younger readers, but all the way through uh, 12th grade. I got people saying, I'm going to use it with my middle schoolers. I'm going to use it with my high schoolers. And I'm going to share it with my 77 year old mama, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. So yeah. So well, what made you um, talk about the Confederate flag as, um, as a symbol for children? to explain it to children. Mm -hmm. I actually first wrote this book in 2015, following the uh, church, Charleston church shootings. Mm. Okay. And if you remember- Not that long ago? It was just, that long ago. Yesterday, oh my goodness. Yeah, it was Eight that years. long ago. Mm -hmm. it was, it and, was, um, was. and if you remember immediately following that, there was this big public debate uh, because the, the murderer, the shooter, mm -hmm. he was seen in social media waving, you know, that flag, a lot of pictures with that flag. And so there was this public debate about whether or not that flag was really a hate symbol or, um, or associated with white supremacy or was just about Southern, you know, heritage and pride. And I was like, the fact that we are still having this conversation, you know, people are actually, truthfully, I'm honestly acting like they don't know the difference. I was like, you know, we need to, I need to write this story for our children because you know that's what I do. And I need to set the record straight so that they don't grow up not really knowing and understanding the history of this flag, um, how it came to be, um, and still what it's being used for, who's using it today and how they're using it. And so, um, so that is what motivated me. But when I wrote it in 2015, um, nobody bought it. Nobody mm. wanted to buy it. My agent at the time didn't even want to send it out. I have a different agent now. But um, so, yeah, so it took until 2020 for the publishing industry uh, industry to be ready. To catch up. Yeah, to catch up. <laughs> exactly. Mm. That's interesting. You know, and it's not for everybody, but one of the, one of the reasons that I self-publish is because uh, if you're doing something controversial, you don't have to wait for somebody to give you a green light because you could be waiting forever, you know, because um, some people are never going to be comfortable with stuff that's uncomfortable. That is, that so. is true. I mean, fair, very fair. And, you know, it's almost fair 
that they feel that way because you have to re really be brave to stand out on your own these days. Because if you have an opinion that is different from the masses opinion, um, social media will attack you. I mean, we, we're seeing that now with the, um, with um, the young lady who, who um, played, who, you know, who was one yeah. of the um, champions. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. LSU. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she did, yeah. she did this. Mm -hmm. You uh, disagree with the masses. They're coming for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, social media right. wasn't Just... like that in the early days. Oh, it really was. I can remember being able to have like two or three day conversations on topics that were, that could be controversial, but people were more intellectual or just more had better manners. Right. And had respect for other people's opinion. Now, nobody seems like, I don't even really say what I think about most things anymore because one, I'm not going to have to defend my opinion where they yeah, are what they I'm are. I'm not arguing with anybody. Right. I'm not you, arguing with anybody. I'll give you a perfect example today. I don't know if you saw my Facebook yesterday when I said, are y'all still arguing about the John Cena move? And, you know, John mm -hmm. Cena made this popular. Mm -hmm. And okay. um, a couple of people came to my, one person came to my page right away and said that it was a rapper. And I don't remember the man's name, Tony somebody. Um, but um, he he actually um, created the move. And I didn't know who he was. So I looked it up and I found a video where John Cena talked about how he got the move from this rapper, Tony. And I posted it to the page or I posted it to the, the um, thread. And I said, yes, you are right that he's not the one who created it, but he's the one who created the You Can't See Me. And then somebody decided to come on my page this morning and say, no, it was popularized by Tony so-and-so. And I said, I know that. Please scroll up <laughs> so you can see. So you can see. <laughs> and he said, well, you're still, you're still yeah. wrong because um, John Cena stole it from him. I said, dear, I'm going to let you have this. It is 7.30 in the morning. It is way too early for me to be arguing with you. <laughs> <laughs> You're better than me because when people come on any of my pages saying something crazy, mm -hmm. I and, and don't let it be the book festivals page. Oh my goodness! I will ban them immediately. And I've had I've had some people say, and, and sometimes it's black people, sometimes it's white people, but they say different things. You know, the the white people will say that it's racist to have a National Black Book Festival. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is so ridiculous. Uh, and the black people, they'll some of them will want to put a diatribe on about something that somebody, some radical person said in the sixties or whatever, and why we shouldn't be. I, it's like I don't need you know I don't need your opinion. <laughs> if you don't want to see it, don't look at it scroll you know say you don't want to see it put it on mute whatever you do but i don't need to be preached to or anything it is not it's you're really wasting your time but anyway it's yeah, difficult that, to have very brave any kind of be able to stand on your truth when you know it's going to be a polarized truth. right now have you gotten any negative feedback Not as much as I had expected to have by good. this point. That's good. Um, maybe a couple of little, yeah, a couple of little reviews on some of the, you know, sites. A couple of people may have said some things, but even those weren't as kind of, what, what I, as terrible as I was expecting. So, um, yeah, not not yet. You know, it's, it's still early in the book's life, and um, you know, I, I'm I'm bucking up to you know i don't need <laughs> for whatever comes well maybe well maybe you don't have to worry about it maybe you have started a positive conversation so that could that could be the case as well yes and yeah. or maybe and maybe too from the cover you really can't tell mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so unless a person actually reads the book mm -hmm. they and, really and one, you know one of the things that i you know 
the feedback that I've been seeing. And I, you know, when you write something, you put it out there, you know, you know what your intentions are, but mm -hmm. then everybody's going to receive it based on however they receive it. Yeah. And so uh, I have seen some reviewers who were white, who said that they thought the way I handled it didn't elicit white guilt. You know? mm -hmm. So but did they so, want it to, or were they glad it didn't know what um, that, that particular person was glad it didn't, they thought that it might make certain people more receptive to the message. That's um, it, it ends on a note of hope. You know what I mean? Not, not uh rainbows and sunshine kind of hope. We don't tie it up in a bow like that, but we do leave the possibility open you know, for, for hope. I don't want to give everything away. Well, no, but, that's, um, that's but, yeah. a point because um, one of the arguments against um, teaching um, intersectionality in schools is that it creates white guilt or that they feel it. They're not going to say it does. They mm -hmm. feel that it creates white guilt and parents will say, I don't want my five-year-old child feeling guilty about something she had nothing to do with. You know, that that's the argument that many parents have. And and, and I and I don't think that that, that argument has any legs mm -hmm. because they're assuming that the child is going to identify with the white person who is doing the the wrong things historically speaking, you know, the oppressive things. They don't identify with them. I posted, I have a little video that I posted on my Facebook about this little boy who found out in school, you know, that the white killed Dr. King and he was <laughs> upset with the white and he was going to get some payback. And his mom said, um, son, you know, you're white. You're like, it wasn't me. <laughs> so, I mean, and so that is, they don't identify with that. So I think I, what I think it is, is that the parents don't want their children to come back and maybe ask some tough questions of them that might make them feel some kind of way. I hear you. But it's not about the kids because right. they are open and they want to know the truth. That's why they ask a million why questions all day long. They want to know the truth and they are natural critical thinkers and they will ask you the tough questions. Oh, and I think that is what people are afraid of. Certain people. Very much critical thinkers. Yeah. Well, facts shouldn't make you feel guilty unless you are guilty. Unless you want to do those types and of things. You know, but facts, you can't can't argue with the facts. Yeah. I mean, you can, but facts are still facts. So if you feel guilty, unless you're complicit, then you know, yeah. you shouldn't feel guilty. Absolutely. But some people um, aren't, you know, that th they're so fragile that they, you know, I don't believe you can't, you can't claim that you can run everything and then you're fragile. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, you can't be both mm -hmm. hard, the hardest nails and fragile. Mm -hmm. So I, you should yeah, be able be... to accept facts mm -hmm. about our history mm -hmm. that are just factual. And mm -hmm. um, there's been some some really tough, very horrible, horrible, really just terrible things that have happened to our ancestors. And, um, but, it, but everything wasn't terrible. And that's one thing I, I really wanted to have a little bit more balance. I'm, I'm not referring to slavery because there's really hardly any balance there that you could find. But, you know, in the, like in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, in that period, um, there was a lot of positive that doesn't get enough exposure um, in, in the way people present it. It's like every day every, people were living like the movie Mississippi Burning, like every day was like that. And it just wasn't. Um, right so you know um so we need a little bit more balance but the facts are what they are and they speak for themselves so yeah well i, I do want to hear a little bit more about the shirley chisholm book 
Yeah, I, and, and that's why I was wondering, do you actually get to go to the schools to read your stories to the kids and actually discuss the stories with them? I've um, had school visits with Not Done Yet, Shirley Chisholm's Fight for Change, and also the other book that came out at the same time, 12 Digging Doorbells, which is about Black family gatherings. So I've done those. I have yet to do a school visit on that flag, but uh, I am anticipating that I will um, be doing that as well. And in fact, uh, Harper Collins has just created an educator guide um, that they should be posting fairly soon um, that will help, you know, educators, media specialists, parents, caregivers to to use the um, the book with their their children. Oh, that's amazing! Is that something that you um, created, or was that something that Harper Collins said? You know what? I think we need this to go with the book. Yes, Harper Collins contracted with a um, a person who does this, you know, on the regular for their job. Um, okay. And yeah, so yeah, Harper Collins created it, and I'm very thankful because it's an excellent educator guy. That that one that's wonderful, and it's a I mean it's a great way to highlight the book, but then it also starts the conversation with the kids, and you never know what type of change you're going to effect. Yes, and it helps those adults who want to have the conversation, like teachers, educators, but they don't know how, they they fear, they're afraid of it. Now, the kids aren't afraid, but they are. The educator guy will kind of hold their hand and help them, you know, to do that. So, yeah. Okay, so tell us a, more, a little bit more about the Shirley Chisholm book and mm -hmm. uh, why did you choose her as a subject? She's an interesting subject, of course, in history, but what made you choose her? Um, yeah. to write about for children. Yeah, well, um, that one happened, um, somebody brought that idea to me. It was like in 2017. And there was this editor who had posted a tweet or or tweeted rather, and that she was interested in a picture book about Shirley Chisholm. And then I had a, an author friend like tag me in that. And then I was just, I was doing all my, my happy black joy books. And I was like, I don't think nonfiction is my lane. So I was like, mm, and I don't think so. But the idea never left my head. And I started researching her and I read her autobiography and I watched the videos about her. And then I just, I recognized, you know what? She reminds me of my grandmother. Wow. Because like my grandmother, she didn't have her level of education at all. They were opposite on that. But that no nonsense attitude, see it all over their face. Um, that was my grandmother. And then on the flip side, like they were funny and they liked to laugh, but then it was that time when it was time it was to be serious. serious, they're not playing the radio. And so when I saw that, I was like, oh, I had, I just, I just felt a connection. I was like, yeah, I gotta, I gotta try. I gotta try to write this. So, yeah. Well, it's good for children to know that someone else ran for president even before President Obama. Absolutely. And also not just her first, because, and we do mention all of her first, she was the first uh, Black uh, representative for Brooklyn, as far as it being in the, an assembly woman. She was the first Black woman elected to Congress, and she was the first Black person or woman to seriously run for the presidency. So those were all of her first. But beyond that, you know, we frame um, the book uh we use the phrase, the refrain, not done yet, because as a change maker, she was never uh, content to just settle for, you know, one thing or sit on her laurels. She would do something, she would, you know, great, and but it wasn't enough. She was a change maker at heart. And so she was not never done yet. And she just kept doing all these things. She started out as a, a, um, an educator, you know, for an early childhood educator. And then she got involved in a political club, a local political club, and she used her voice to speak out and make change in there. And from there, she just kept going and going. And so she, you know, her, her spirit where she didn't like to be bossed from when she was a baby, it never left her. And that's what made her the type of maverick who was not beholden to the political powers that be, because that wasn't what motivated her. She was about her people and she was about the things that she felt were important, which was childcare, uh, uh, education, 
um, health care, you know, all those types of things. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of how we frame the book. And we, we, we also um, consider it like a call to the young reader. You know, this is, you know, this is how you do it. You use your one voice to yeah. speak up for what you believe in and make change. So, so that, so that's how we, we um, have framed that book. And that's why it's called Not Done Yet. Okay, well, Tamika, we're near the end of our time. Can you show us the two book covers again so people sure. can know what they're going to be looking for when they go to buy your books? Yes. That black, that black. beautifully, be they're both very beautifully illustrated. Yes, by Nicholas Smith. He's the illustrator for this one. Um, he did Born on the Water, um, the 1916 project, Born on the Water. And oh, this, okay. Yeah. And this is not done yet. And it was illustrated by Nina Cruz. And she did a fabulous job with this. It's, it's amazing. Okay. Like, well, it's gonna be. Your, um, your links in the um, chat, uh, because there are people who are asking how they can get the, um, both of these books, because um, you have very beautiful stories. I mean, Shirley Chisholm is a hero to many. Um, because she showed bravery at a time where it wasn't cool to show that type of bravery. Absolutely. So, um, thank, thank you for keeping these stories alive. Thank you for starting this conversation with our young people, and maybe they can make a difference as they get older. So Absolutely. And thank you for letting me uh, share these two stories with your, um, your viewers. Okay, congratulations again. And thank we'll you. see you probably next year when you do another book all right sounds good I'm, look i'm still wrapping y'all oh thank you <laughs> bye okay you have a great evening you too okay bye-bye bye-bye okay so our second guest is well known to many because she's written lots of books and i've read at least i want to say at least six of Tanana Reeves' books, uh, at least. And two of them are in my top 20 of all time. And I've read thousands of books. So I want to let you know that My Soul to Keep and The Living Blood are in my top 20 of all time. Thank you welcome, very much. Welcome to Black Office Matter TV. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Then congratulations. I have a copy of your book. They sent it, the publisher sent it. So we're going to be giving it away. Oh, nice. The new one. The high cover. We're going to be giving it away at the end of the interview. And we give it away to our viewers based on trivia questions. So we'll oh. do it while you're on screen. Okay. But um, the last, I did see you at the National Black Book Festival, but I, I didn't get a chance to talk to you because. Oh, I we might have just passed in the hallway then. Right. Right, you and your and your husband Stephen. So, um, oh, that was oh, you mean years ago? Yeah, years ago. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I, five. Years, it was twenty nineteen or twenty eighteen. One of them. Okay. When the old times, the before days. Before COVID, <laughs> yeah, before yeah. <laughs> before COVID. So, um, now this is one of your only, your second book of short stories. Yes. So, what made you decide to focus on short stories? It's called the Wishing Pool put it up again the wishing pool and, and other stories, stories. well so, i don't know if your your viewers know this but this is my first book in seven years so it's not like i decided to focus on like writing a, a short story collection it's just that from time to time editors would ask me to submit a story to an anthology and i would say yes and that happened so many times that i finally had enough for a second book which is how my first book happened too just people asking me i don't typically just start writing a short story out of the blue <laughs> it's because someone asked me to and the reason for the long delay between books is that I've been working on screenwriting right so, yeah right. You trying have, to build that you up. Doing some, I've been following you on on social media and the roundtable meetings that y'all are having with other writers and things like that so um just give us a highlight about some of the stories that are in um, the living pool and then uh, let us in on some of the other work you're doing with the screenwriting. Well sure the wishing pool um, actually the first story is one that's very near and dear to me 
because I wrote it, uh, which is called The Wishing Pool. Mm -hmm. I wrote when I was about to visit my father for the first time after COVID. And uh, he's 88 now. So back then he might have been about 86, eight, up there. Mm -hmm. And I was concerned that his health might have deteriorated since my last visit. And so what I always do, often do, is put my true life fears into my writing. So I created a story about a woman pretty much exactly like me visiting her dad trying to work, but it, it, I changed it significantly because my dad lives in great comfort in a two-story house with an elevator with my sister in Atlanta, you know, how they do in Atlanta. Um, and in the story, he's living in a remote cabin in the woods <laughs> because I love the woods. I love <laughs> cabins. There are a lot of, there are a couple stories in the woods in this collection. But it's really uh, reflecting on the things in my own life that are scary, my own fears, whether it's my own mortality, like a story like The Biographer, which is a new story that's never been published before at the very end, uh, or, you know, just the traumas we go through in life. I'm really, really proud of a new novelette because it's actually pretty long in the collection called Rumpus Room, which is really what I wanted the title to be. I thought the title should be Rumpus Room, but the the uh, publisher didn't want to do that. So that's okay. I love The Wishing Pool, but Rumpus Room is pretty scary. And it, part of what makes it scary is what's going on outside of this woman's head. And, and part of what's scary is what's going on inside of her head. And that's all I'm going to say. Well, okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, you your your writing is uh well. Let me say this: when I when I first read My Soul to Keep, mm -hmm. I had never read a book like it before. Um, that was my first time reading anything supernatural or, mm, um, okay. or anything like that. And then the I don't want to give it away. So <laughs> the Living Blood was just crazy. Yeah, I was the, just like what? <laughs> and that's why I wanted to know how about your um story ideas what is your thought process when you come up with these stories because I really feel like you're one of the trailblazers when it comes to um this type of writing when, you know that um suspense suspense filled um I don't I don't even want to call it fantasy I just want to I just want to say suspense filled mm -hmm. um these story ideas well, they usually start very small and very personal, believe it or not. I mean, The Living Blood is my epic sort of international globe trotting novel. I really feel sorry for people who read that one after The Black Rose, which is my historical novel about Madam C.J. Walker, because they'd be like, where did that come from? But yeah, I it read started, that one too. <laughs> it started the with my... of Black Rose. I read that one too. Very, very good. Very well written. Thank you. But, but it started uh, My Soul to Keep, which came before The Living Blood. It's in a series I call my African Immortal series. And there are four books. And that first one, I really just started meaning to be a standalone novel. I had no idea that I would write three more. And it really had to do, frankly, with my dating life. I was a, I was single. I was in my late 20s. I was a reporter for the Miami Herald. I am Jessica, except I, it was a more idealized version of Jessica because she was someone who actually liked being a reporter. <laughs> and for me, that was just my day job while I was working on this. I was writing a dating column. She was on the investigative team. So I kind of amplified myself up to 11 and created Jessica as me. And it really started with that question because when I was single, I was making a lot of bad choices. I really do take full responsibility for the bad choices. And often people would tell me or show me who they were, but I didn't believe it. And I was really attracted to the difficulty of opening up someone who was emotionally distant. That was my catnip. That was my, my thing, was someone who was emotionally distant. Let me come and fix that. Let me change you. Let me force you to let me into your heart. So person after person, I felt like... Honest. It's so romanticized that um, a woman is going to come along and make a man want to change. Yeah. And I think we all want to be that woman. So sometimes we put up with things that we don't need to put up with. Oh my goodness, no. But what, yeah, and and don't feel bad. We've all made bad choices. Oh, I, I know, know we have. Who has, I, don't know, I mean, there might, the volume might be different, but we've all made <laughs> 
Not you. If we have done this. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, this was in my 20s, and hopefully we don't continue to do it as we right. get older, you know, thanks to therapy and experience. But that was my thing back in the day. And as a result of my not seeing what was right in front of me, which is Jessica doesn't notice that her husband isn't aging in all these years, that he doesn't get sick in all these years. So as a result of me not seeing things, I felt like people were pretending to be, to be someone they weren't. And that wasn't the case. They were not pretending to be someone they weren't. It's just that I was not seeing who they really were. And I thought, huh, that's an interesting like character for the, the woman, someone who's in a marriage that is based on, frankly, a whole bunch of lies. I mean, he loves her. And my readers were very forgiving of him because he loves her and he loves his daughter. I mean, even though he did some pretty unforgivable things, I was pretty shocked at how readers were willing to accept his behavior because I said he was fine. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that's the only reason, but I think that's a lot of it. I really do think that's a lot of it. Cause I like at the end of the book and I won't spoil it. I was like, y'all still riding with David <laughs> after all this, it just happened. And they're like, Oh, but so that, it, it, so to answer your idea about where the ideas come from, it really is sort of everyday life in the beginning, but I have this weird prism where I like to look at things from a supernatural aspect. I like to look at things from a slightly science fiction sometimes uh, aspect, like how do you take this real life thing and express it in a story that both feels like life, but also something different and something bigger than life. And, and really the living blood, which is much more epic. It's huge. It's like I said, it's globe trotting. That whole thing was, what is it like to raise a powerful child? That was the seed of it. When you have a child who's literally more powerful than you are, and for toddlers, you know, a lot of parents like run into this toddler wall, and it's not like they're physically more powerful than you, but sometimes you feel like, oh, shoot, I am not, I was not prepared. I was not ready. I am not enough. You know, a lot of mothers will say this to themselves. And I was also just taking that out to the nth degree. What if you really weren't ready? What if this child is not just powerful because they have a lot of emotions, but because they can actually do something with those emotions? So you, you sound like you live in the what if world. And that's where your stories come from. You'll look at something that's an everyday thing and ask yourself, what if? And then exactly. you ride that wave. Exactly. And the character yeah. development is just amazing. Uh, okay. I read another book of yours uh it was after it was after the the black rose and the living blood the good house jocelyn's ghost no uh, it had a it. white cover i think would you say a white cover mm -hmm. with some uh, well, i may be getting mixed too. up but i thought Devil's i thought i read another one of yours i know i read the between but that was that was an earlier book. And that was a, not that, that thick, was it was a, book. it was like a, it was your first book. Was yeah, it? Yeah, that was my very first oh, book. I didn't know. Yeah. See, I didn't read it first. You know how you get oh, introduced yeah. to author and you don't didn't. read them in order. <laughs> <laughs> and You're not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people still have her. <laughs> it was, you know, your character development is just really amazing. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. It's just, um, you know, I'm going to give a little bit of credit where I feel some credit is due. I grew up reading Stephen King, you know, and there are people who have issues with Stephen King or don't like Stephen King. But for me, almost the primary lesson was character development. Like it was like, you can put, if you believe people are real, you can put them in any scenario and the readers will keep reading. Like, for instance, if you really believe in this mother and son, you will read 500 pages about them trapped in a car while a dog is barking outside, which kind of is the plot to Cujo, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not making it sound as scary as it is, but it's not that I was so hot on reading about a rabid dog. It's that once you start reading, I mean, you just believe it's real because the people feel so real. And that was what I learned, I think, from him as a reader. Mm. And I really wanted to try to create that. I wanted to try to create people who feel so real that this other crazy stuff I'm talking about also seems real, like blood that can heal any disease, or you live in a haunted house with a demon, 
or whatever it is. That all feels real because the characters feel real is my hope. Have you had a chance to meet Stephen King? Or did you ever have a chance to meet Stephen King? I did. I did meet him once. Uh, actually, actually, a couple times. Because when I was working for the Miami Herald, he was with the band called the Rock Bottom Remainders. And Dave Barry, the humorist, who also worked for the Miami Herald, mm-hmm. invited me after I approached him to play with the Rock Bottom Remainders. I have a keyboard uh, right over uh, in my corner over here. And uh, oh, okay. I love music. Oh no, I messed up my camera. I love music. <laughs> and uh, so I was able to play a couple, you know, songs with the band and I gave him a copy in the between and he blurred my soul to keep. That's how he ended up writing a quote for my soul to keep because I had actually met him. I didn't oh. just send it in the mail and say, hey, will you, re-? no, I, it, I think it really helps. I got to fix this. I'm so OCD. It really helps to have a personal, oh, I made it worse, to have a personal connection. <laughs> Let me leave that there. I touch it again. <laughs> yeah, I have. I've. I've never read a full Stephen King book. And I, the two that I tried to read were a thousand pages. Maybe that's why I went wrong. But and I a long book doesn't bother me. But the stand was the last. I tried to read that oh, one two long, months ago, and I got book. to page six hundred. Oh, you almost made it. It's like I, but I, I had like two. 300 more to go <laughs> and I put it down because I had to read something else for a book club and I never did get back to it. It was right. interesting. I was really reading it because of COVID, you know, because the stand was about a pandemic. And so I was, on a, I was on a podcast where we talked about like 200 pages every, I forget, month during COVID. <laughs> so yeah, it was a perfect companion for COVID if that's what you were looking for. Yes, it was. And so it was, I mean, and he's, he's a great writer. It, it takes a lot of writing skills to write 900 pages of one story. I mean, that's, I that's, that's some serious writing skills. I don't plan to try that anytime soon. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I'll get to page 300. I'm like, okay, I have to end this story. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't say that. Because the novel I have coming out in October, I was kind of shocked at how thick it is. You know, I know I worked on it for seven years. It's called the Reformatory, but um, I didn't realize. Let me let me grab it. I didn't realize how how big. Look at this. Oh, like, okay. Is that, so is that the art? Like, Why is this so big? That's a textbook. It, well, <laughs> don't say that. But yeah, kind of. Uh, so well, I know I'll story. be reading it because I I don't think I missed. I didn't read the Good House. Is that what the name of it? That's probably my scariest book, to be honest. So I you might want to go back to that one. I don't think I read that. One. That's my scariest. Did you write the fledgling, or was that Octavia Butler? That's Octavia Butler. Okay, that's the book that I had in my mind. Um, and the oh, the no, white cover with stuff on the background. But to, well, but I, I will I will address that. Oh, you mean the white cover background? The black background. Uh huh. Okay, I thought you meant white characters because that is no, also- no, no. The cover of the book was yeah. white, like, and it had like designs on. It. Oh, Rhonda, your your sound is. What'd you say? Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, I was just I just wanted to know what you were going to say about white characters. Oh well, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, you know we live in a great era in publishing now when we see lots of beautiful black and brown faces on our book covers. But there are a lot of writers who back in the day, me included, unfortunately, where the publisher felt that the best way to sell the book was to have a white face on the cover. So it happened to Octavia Butler. It happened to my husband, Stephen Barnes. And to a degree, uh, I mean, not that long ago, I'm trying to think what year it was, maybe 2012, 2011, 2010, uh, we wrote a young adult zombie series, uh, Devil's Wake and Domino Falls. And there's a little white girl on the cover and when they showed us that cover art, I literally, we literally had to write a scene so that it would make sense because the protagonist of that is a 16 year old black teenager. And then there's a white male who's about 17, but there was no white little girl in the whole book, not mentioned, not even alluded to. So we literally wrote a scene where they pass a little white girl on the road <laughs> so that the cover would make sense. You know, that's interesting because as you were telling that story, I uh, I thought about my daughter who's um, in the acting industry and she noticed, she pointed out to me 
that um, if you're looking at Netflix and you're trying to decide what movie you want to watch, the, the movie may have the most minor black character in the movie, but that black character is going to be on the promo photo because I guess they feel it's going to attract more black people to watch that movie. So times have changed and, and, and money talks, you know, and I think the film and television industry have discovered that because we've been so erased up until now, frankly, uh, or you're just a side character or you're like poor Shamar Moore on Criminal Minds, how, how many seasons was that show on? And he never really had a girlfriend. Right. What? I mean, what? Like we, we learn the personal lives of everybody else but him. And Blair Underwood told us about it one time that it was the same thing on LA Law back in the day that the, the, the staff writers of the TV shows are not sure how to write black characters because they were all white mm -hmm. and they, they were nervous. So they would write about everybody else's lives at home, but we were such a mystery. I heard another story about that with Sammy Davis Jr. from back in the fifties, like white writers were like, well, I don't know, what should we write for him? How do we write a black person? It's like, well, you start with a person <laughs> Let's start with that. <laughs> that that then, has all of the same emotions and needs, human needs. Yeah, that I mean, all humans yeah. have. Yeah, and, and if that's all you get, it might be a little bland and non-specific, but it's better than nothing. But I mean, the real answer is to have black people behind the camera in the writers' room so they can help right. school people. Representation. Because there's a lot of education that is still necessary, obviously, yeah, and I also it helps to have a black friend that you can actually yeah. have to read. Um, yeah, well, uh, that you, that, whose opinion you respect and who's just not an ornament, you know? Yeah, um, exactly. Well, do you think we should thank James Patterson for creating a character like Alex Cross, who was a prominent Black man in his um, series? Um, has, has helped a little bit? I, I have no issue with writing the other. I haven't read any of the Alex Cross, I must admit. But I do remember back in the day when there seemed to be a lot more African-American bookstores uh, back in the 90s when I started publishing that a lot of those stores were carrying James Patterson because of that character. So I think Black readers have felt like, yay, you know, they got somebody. Um, I'm not sure his reasons for doing that. And I don't object to it as long as you do it in a way that's respectful. And I haven't heard any complaints about it. So I'm assuming uh, it works. Yeah, now I never have watched Criminal Minds. Uh, but that's, so that's news to me about him not having a girlfriend because that doesn't make any sense. But you know, the, the newer show, FBI, I don't know if you ever have watched it. I, I like, I like um, police shows. Well, some of them, I like a lot of legal shows. I watch medical shows. I like dramas, uh, but FBI, the newer one, there's three different ones, but the one that's just FBI has a black woman FBI agent. I don't know her name mm -hmm. is an actress. Mm -hmm. Very attractive woman. She's never had a boyfriend on the show. Everybody else, and this is now, this is this yeah. is the now show. In fact, my DVR is recording it tonight. So she, she, everybody else, all the other FBI agents have had romantic encounters or spouses or somebody. <laughs> Except her. And, and 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 my prediction is that when they finally do give her a love interest, he will not He'll be, be white. Yeah. He'll oh, you knew what I was going to say. Uh, yeah. You know, and no shade to interracial couples. I have many in my life. But when it comes to the media, it's very convenient to have as few Black characters as possible. And they're always looking for ways to center themselves. So that's how you end up with all these Black, I mean, white boyfriends, white husbands, um, mm -hmm. Black characters or, in isolation, like they're the only Black person, they don't have any friends or family. Right. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, or in commercials now, what's extremely common is even if they have a Black couple with, with both people being Black, the parent, the mother and the father, the child is biracial. Now, that is not possible by <laughs> <laughs> that listen, that's a whole <laughs> long, that's a whole long conversation. conversation right there. <laughs> it has to do with colorism. It has to do with which children are getting the experience as actors and which aren't, right. so that they're performing better in their auditions. Mm -hmm. There's like a whole that's like a whole different segment. It is, but it's it's all connected, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I I did want to go to the comments. I know we're getting close to the oh. end of the segment. But and I want then we need to give away the book. So we need to. Oh, yes, yes. We that. have to do that too. 
But Stephanie Burnham wanted to know if you if you attend conferences like BlurCon, Afrofuturism Cycle, or Zora. I have not attended any of those. Interesting. I have attended many, but these might be new. Post COVID, my travel has been somewhat limited, and because I have two books coming out this year. I doubt I would be adding any new travel that's not related to the bookstore appearances. I'm, I, I think I'll be at a national book club again in uh, Atlanta later this summer. And I, I, yeah, I have some places that I'm going, but maybe in the future, I mean, Blurred Con, is that, that sounds, that sounds fun. Yes, Blur, Blur I mean, I'm not, I'm, I don't know, if, I'm not going to say I'm not a nerd because in some, in a lot of ways I am a nerd. But I don't know if I'm at that blurred kind level, but I would love to go and just talk with them and just soak soak in what they're doing because I, it's fun. I, I it's love fun. Blur, blurbs. <laughs> yeah, they're just they're readers and they're very enthusiastic readers yes. and they're very careful readers. So it's it's a great place to uh, to meet people who yeah. also love books. Okay. Yeah. And then Tamara Grant Perkins said you're one of her favorite authors, and she's well, already you. ordered your book. Oh, fantastic. Well, I thank you very much. I appreciate that. I am excited. You know, um, it, it's a little bit of a surprise because I just realized one day I had enough short stories for another book. And then I had to decide where to try to publish it. And my first publisher was a very, very small publisher for Ghost Summer, my other short story collection. Mm -hmm. And this time I, I went to um, a publisher. I had submitted stories for other people's anthologies for, like um, South Central Noir just came out that Gary Phillips edited. Um, oh, Tiari Jones edited Atlanta Noir, and I had submitted a story for that. So I had kind of a relationship with this publisher, and I think they've done a fantastic job with the book. Okay. Awesome. Well, um, we have a trivia question that we're going to ask the audience, and whoever gets the answer first will win their copy of The Wishing Pool and Other Stories by Tanana Reeve, too. So here is the trivia question. What course does award-winning author Tanana Reeve do teach at UCLA? Ooh. I know the answer. I know the answer. <laughs> This is the trick question because I, I teach two, so so they have to. Well, think. see, I didn't know if that was one course or two. That's courses. okay. It's okay, so okay. but one I'm better known for teaching. I'll tell you that. Okay. That's probably the one so you're thinking. If they get one or the other or both, that's fine. So yes, this is all. These are questions that we ask always. They can be found online in the synopsis or bio or whatever. So who and whoever answers first. Uh, gets the book. Now tell us a little bit about the reformatory and, and Rhonda will be checking the the chat for who see who gets the book. I will really quickly. Soon after my late mother passed away in 2012, I got a call from the Florida Attorney General's office to let me know that I had a relative buried on the grounds of the Dozier School for Boys in Mariana, Florida. And you might have heard about Dozier. Uh, it's also the fictionalized reformatory that Colson Whitehead wrote about in the Nickel Boys. Uh, he beat me. <laughs> you know, I've been working on it since 2013 and he still beat me. <laughs> but that's, but it's okay. Mine has ghosts and his doesn't. So it's basically about a haunted reformatory and a boy who is trying to get out of there and his sister is trying to help him get out. And what happens when you try to be friends with a with a ghost? Let's just say that. So oh. Ghosts are like, they, they, they hit different. They, they've got a whole different mentality than the living do. So you can be friends with a ghost in the world of this story, but watch your back. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> watch okay. your I, back. Yes. I always ask people, um, um, cause I'm very, I'm very enchanted with, um, people who write, um, the type, the type of work you do. I, like I said, I don't really want to, I don't know if you consider your work fantasy or, um, or paranormal. Yeah, um, yeah, some of it. Yeah. Um, do you feel do, do you feel you have to have um, a bit of an understanding of science or a scientific background in order to write these stories? If I were more of a science fiction writer, the answer would absolutely be yes. That's why whenever I do write science fiction, typically it would be near, near, very near future. <laughs> so I don't have to think too much <laughs> about trends in technology. I don't have to overthink it. One of the few stories I've had rejected in recent years was me trying to write science fiction uh, in space, which turned out to be really, really um, ambitious. 
for me on that deadline. So I do try to stay in my lane in terms of my connection to horror. Um, some people might call it uh, fantasy uh, when it's imaginary places and imaginary creatures. Um, but yeah, if you're writing science fiction, I do suggest to writers lean into the sciences. You know, uh, Octavia Butler is famous for her social science fiction, like Parable of the Sower, which is near future and where we're headed if we don't watch out or maybe where we've already arrived. But she also wrote a lot of scientifically grounded stories like uh, her Xenogenesis. I mean, you can barely pronounce it stories which are very much based in her knowledge of biology and and science and study and so I would love it to have sort of this connection between STEM or STEAM which is like STEM but with the arts included and more writers who take yeah. their interest in science and learn how to create art. I love that yeah. yeah. Now I will tell you three people have answered the question. Oh okay. shoot. And, but the first person to answer was Stephanie Burnham. And she okay. said, Black Horror what did she say? She said, Black Horror and Afrofuturism. Ooh, she's exactly right. She got mm -hmm. both of them. So uh, I guess, yeah. Stephanie, you're the winner. And Stephanie wins books often. Wow, <laughs> Stephanie is on it. She is on it. So Stephanie, your book will be on its way to you. So Tanana, we're at the end of our time. I'm I had some other questions I wanted to ask, but we'll have to have you back on in the future so we can delve more, maybe ap after your um, formatory book comes out. Yeah, can, that's in October. So we yeah. can check back in during the spooky season. Well, very good to talk to both of you and thank you for your questions. Okay, it's thank you. And, and, and thank you for creating such an amazing body of work I for appreciate readers it. to enjoy. I really appreciate it. I just feel lucky that people still remember me. So to still be publishing this this long after I first started publishing is a real blessing. Okay, and, and continue success, especially with your screenwriting and all that you're Stephen are doing. That's Thank you really very great. much. Appreciate that. All, all right. right. Well, you have a great night. Thank you so you much. You too. It was all right. Good to speak with you. Great to talk to you too. Bye bye everybody. Bye bye. Okay, well, we have, uh, let me make note of Stephanie Burnham winning the book. And Stephanie, we have your address. <laughs> so, if you don't have her. If you don't have her, I don't have anybody. So um, we're going to be bringing on our next guest, um, who also is a horror writer. I have a good friend who I mentioned to you all in the past, Rhonda Jackson Garcia. And she writes horror, and she made me aware of a couple of horror writers that I didn't even know about. One of them was on um, last week or the week before, Johnny Compton. And then tonight we have Elle Marie Wood on as our guest. So we're going to bring her on. And she has won the, a whole bunch of horror awards for her writing. And she does all kinds of other writing, screenwriting, and um, all kinds of right. So welcome to Black Authors Matter TV. Thank you so much. So did you go by Marie? El Marie. Oh, El you go by El Marie. Okay. El Marie. Yes. Okay. And you won the Bram Stoker Award, which remind me, did he do Frankenstein or Dracula? He did Dracula, but not yet. I'm just nominated. Fingers crossed. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> we don't it's find out until mid June. Oh, nominated. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see that now. It's on a second line. Oh, I got you. <laughs> so it, an award, then it had nominated been look, but you did win the Golden Stake Award for your novel, The Promise Key. That I did. It's right behind me, actually. It's a, an actual golden stake with some blood on the end of it. <laughs> oh, I see that. You see that? Oh my goodness, that's so morbid. <laughs> it's morbid, but it's also one of the coolest things I've ever seen. <laughs> wow. So is what is that? Is that that's not the book itself. Is it? That's the goal. No, the one beneath. Okay, so let me, I can grab. The yeah, let me. <laughs> I didn't know this. Like, that'd be the spine of the book. You know, that'd be different in publishing. Oh, this okay. is the, the prop. That would be a heck of a book, wouldn't it, though? That I mean, would be. I know. Like <laughs> <laughs> this is the promise keeper. That's This is what won the Golden State. Oh, what? okay. All right. Yeah. And then, and you've, you've just done a lot of right now. This horror is something that I don't read or I shouldn't say I don't read 
I have read paranormal things that were horror, but it was more the author that I was reading than the genre that okay. I was reading. So, but but I'm learning more and more. And we had um, Johnny Compton on last yes. week or the week before, and his book, the, um, the Spite House, sounded really interesting. So I ordered it. So tell me about your latest book, which is that the latest one, the one you just showed us or? No, my latest one is actually the, well, my, I was about to mention something different, but my latest one is a companion set and it's a novella with a short story collection attached. So uh, long story short, the people who are living and breathing within the novella are reading the short stories that you can find in that short story collection that's con you know, com combined with it. And if they finish that story or any of those stories, they die. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> well, that's, I'm, not that's... Reading, I'm not reading your stories, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> you know that it's-, it's I love it. It's <laughs> you know, the thing about it is, horror is a lot of things right i mean i think that there's there's about 36 subgenres to horror fiction and i write the what's really on the quieter side of things now what, of course what i just mentioned is my one of my first forays into traditional horror fiction but mo more of my work is psychological horror so while that doesn't mean that there's no blood at all that there's no guts and whatever it's not that's not the main point of the story there is a the psychological component which brings in more of the fear of the a the lived experience and the fear of what you might encounter in that lived experience so it's it's relatable stuff which to me makes it a lot scarier mm. I, I think so I, I some of the scariest movies and even stories to me are the ones that don't don't seem over the top like Freddy Krueger and Jason, they don't scare me, but those Chucky. More... <laughs> yeah, Chucky doesn't scare me. No, but... I think we all thought we would have kicked that doll. <laughs> I don't watch those kind of movies mm -hmm. I, because I it's like, you know, you know what's going to happen. This is a bunch of blood and cutting and stuff. And, somebody jumping out like you know the music mm. is the most suspenseful part normally because you don't know and you know somebody's going to jump out but you don't know when so that's the that's the right part. and that's what most people think when they think of all horror every bit of it and and I get it I do get it because that's the easiest depiction to put on film it really is and that's most of the way that people consume their horror fiction um reading horror fiction is a completely different thing the the you know yes there's that same thing you can have the same sort of blood and guts and gore and some possessed doll or these are not things that are uncommon um in in horror fiction but the making the mundane real and then twisting it <laughs> twisting it to where you might something might be behind an aisle at a supermarket or something what, something you're going to pick up in a store suddenly loses its form and changes into some kind of portal. That kind of thing, if, if built properly, that's the thing that resonates because you'll be in that store. You'll be in a supermarket at some point in your week. You'll see that, you know, list, a rack of bread that you can choose from. And if I have somehow twisted a story to make you wonder about that bread, the next time you go to the supermarket, you're not going to look at it the same way. And you probably never will if I've done my job right. So that's the difference between what that sort of, you know, it's like movies like Hostel. Have you, do you any ever see the movie Hostel? It's sort of like torture, horror, like yeah. Saw, but oh, torture. misery, like misery. Well, or? no, misery is not. No, misery was torture. Definitely. But mm. I, I mean, <laughs> on a grand scale with many people being tortured and body. Parts oh, and oh, OK. That kind of stuff is not the same as what I'm writing. It's a different okay. subgenre and it, it has its own merits. I mean, there's something to be said about visceral horror, which is what that would be categorized as if you were reading it. Um, there's something to be said for that, but there's also something to be said about the quieter side of horror, the, you know, the piece that is not gonna have some real huge vampire, even though I, like I did write the vampire, but it was a psychological horror story about a vampire. It wasn't, the, the vampire was merely a character in the book as opposed to, the, the the whole idea of vampirism okay. being the whole book okay. so i just really focus on the lived experience and think about what might actually bother me 
and see if I can, you know, tweak it and make it bother everybody else. <laughs> I, I like that. I like that. And I, that's why I said those are the ones that are scariest to me. I mean, it plays on what people's natural fears really are. And you just take them to a different level. Right. Right. Exactly. Now, now that you, oh, go ahead, Linda. Okay. I was just going to ask, how do you, how do you um, come up with the ideas of what fears you want to build on? Well, it's interesting. I, I don't, I don't know how this happens. I don't have a whole lot of, of form thoughts. Like I don't have to sit there thinking about an idea of something. Um, what I do is I go out and I live life and I see what happens. And you know, you're sitting at a traffic light. Well, what happens if that traffic light falls? Every traffic light falls to the ground and smashes. What, what, what's the traffic pattern? Why would it be that? Human nature. What happens when people don't know what to do? You know, we all learn that if, you, if you're of a certain age, you remember where you were when 9-11 happened. So what happened when we couldn't, if you're depend, also depending on where you were located, so you couldn't make a cell phone call for hours and hours and hours. You couldn't get through to anyone. You couldn't use the public transportation. And, it, you know, we'd all just started not carrying a whole lot of money. So everybody was using credit cards, but those were down, you know. So what were you going to do? Do you help someone with a couple dollars to be able to get them on a, in a cab and get themselves home? Or do you hoard your money? You know, horror doesn't have to be some beast coming out of a, of a hole. It can be lack of, em of empathy and, you know, uh, uh, turning your back on, on mankind and then see what happens when you behave that way. So I like to, the what if is my, my way of coming up with answers, you know, and if that, if the answer is, you know, everything falls into mayhem and it's terrifying at the end of it, then that's, that's just where it went. So yeah, I, I don't know. I guess I'm, I guess I just follow my nose with it and see where it goes. That I, I love. I just love that answer. <laughs> just Thank you. That. I know. I know Gwen is about to ask something, but I just had to tell you I love that answer. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, I wanted to know: Did you write these kinds of stories as a kid? You know, most writers that have uh, the creative that are that are real writers. I mean have been writing for since they can almost remember they start off writing certain kinds of stories um i know rashonda tate billingsley when she speaks she tells about writing some stories as a kid and they were completely false and uh, her mom got called to the school because she was writing about drive-by shootings and things like that and they didn't live in a neighborhood like that. So, so her imagination was um, created even as a kid. So were you mm -hmm. writing these kinds of stories as a youngster? Sadly, yes. I, since, I was, <laughs> since I was five, um, I have been writing this psychological horror. I mean, I'm a pure psychological horror author and I've been doing it since I was five. My poor mother and grandmother. And I remember that I wrote this you know, wrote this thing out. It was what we could call it a short story now. It's not, you know, it wasn't long, but for me, it was a book. Okay. At five years old, that was a book. And I wrote this thing and I gave it to them. And I can remember my grandmother who like, she was like 70 at the time. And she's looking at this going, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I give it to my mother and my mom's like, well, <laughs> and they, and they, they, but what the, the beauty of that is that it wasn't, oh, why would you write this? Right. Well, what happened? What, 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 something's wrong. This is not, you know, why would you think this way? It was, this was an interesting story. I like how you got to the end of this. What if this happened? And I remember it so clearly. And it, that's the encouragement I think that everyone needs whenever they start writing. Not to say that everything's joy and roses. You need an honest critique, right? But the, a lot of times when we write horror fiction, some people who are not necessarily close, well, that's unfortunate, let me change that because sometimes it is a close person, but people may say, oh, there's something the matter with that one. You know, something going on with her. I don't know why she would think that way or why he would put that down on paper or, you know, they need, they need religion, they need help, they need psychiatric care, blah, blah. Things can be quite, quite rough on people who have creative minds that go that to that side. And, uh, that can stop a lot of people from following a passion. 
you know? So I am just so thankful that that wasn't the response. I don't know how I didn't scare them at five years old, <laughs> but they didn't say, let's never give her a pen again. You know, <laughs> don't let her write anything. They let, they, they went ahead and they indulged all the stories. And then I would go on to write essays in school and they would, you know, the essays were fine. But then when we got to the point where we could write whatever we wanted creatively, it would always be something kind of dark. But again, I'm quiet, quiet and psychological are not the same as there's blood all over the page, but mm -hmm. the dread that I was trying to develop, you know, I was working on and I had to continue to work on it. And my teachers had to, I hate to put it this way, but bear the brunt of it. But what they all would comment on was, you really developed that plot well. I love this character development. Keep that, keep trying that. Your voice, maybe you need to think about your voice. It's you're slipping, this is your tense, you're going in and out. Mechanics, they mm. didn't say, oh my God, what's the matter with her? That's encouragement so, and development. And yeah. that helps you become a better writer. I never once, from the people who in my at that time mattered, never once got the, there's something to matter. Now, I, that's not to say I never got there's something to matter. You know, unfortunately, I thought, I think a lot of us find in our lives, we, we I don't want to say lose friends, but I think that that would, that'll resonate with a lot of us because it's true. I mean, just put plainly, we, we've lost a lot of friends along the way. Not everybody understands the writing journey and not everyone understands being a writer that writes dark fiction. So it can be, it can be rough, but I, I, since a child, I have been writing this kind of creepy stuff and being accepted for it. And I'm just so thankful for that. Yeah. That's so that's what planted the seed of, of, you know, of that, do you know where, when you're watching scary movies or cartoons, no, no. <laughs> I watched the same stuff we all did, which is probably scary stuff. I mean, Scooby-Doo is not the easiest. Think about it now. If you watch Scooby-Doo now, you're like, wow, that's a little, <laughs> you know, and the Acme Roadrunner always getting fallen off and stuff. Mm -hmm. So perhaps th that stuff's a little rough, but I'm almost certain that's not it. I think I was just born this way. I think that a lot of times we are. You know, to mm -hmm. write well, that's that young. True. That's true. When you write yeah. and read at a young age, mm -hmm. it's just in you. Yeah. And, um, this is there. This is like a gift, just like artists. People mm -hmm. who are, are artists, as little kids, three and four, their drawings look like something. Right, exactly. It's not, you know, it they the gift is is obvious early. And or any gift that we, we don't have some something that we're good at innately. And That's true. if we're lucky, our parents help us develop it. Or whoever our caregivers are. Exactly. But sometimes it's a teacher. Some some people have gifts. Their parents don't really encourage them. But someone else that's a mentor or a teacher or someone else in their lives encourages them. Definitely so. Definitely. Yeah. So I had a mentor that actually, he I don't know. Well, he knew what he was doing. It took me years and years to figure out what Dr. Simmons was doing there. But um, <laughs> he showed me that I would, didn't actually want to do the career I thought I really wanted showed me by putting me in the roles that I would not have taken, you know, on a film set. I write screenplays, of course, but I didn't know I wanted to do that. I, I came there thinking I might want to try that, but I thought I was going to be behind the camera and that's what I would do. And then he, I could do the behind the camera stuff just fine, but the editing and all the just picking through film to get to the, a certain specific point or finding this and digging a box for this and you know, just all of the sort of, I don't want to call it grunt work, but that's what, it, that's what I feel like he was trying to make me experience. And I realized, well, I mean, this is part of it and I don't think that's for me, you know? And so I, I had to sit down and think about it. And it was funny. I remember once he, you know, I went to school in DC, I went to Howard and he was, uh, we would work late. He was working on a documentary and we were working with him, you know, if you were lucky enough to get on, which I, I was. Um, and I was looking for something he had asked me to find about an hour before. And he was getting ready to go out. I mean, it was like nine o'clock at night. You know, that's when you're in school, you just work however long, doesn't matter. We were there until one. He was gone. Right. But you know, yeah. He uh he he says, Okay, I'm getting ready to go out. I mean, he came in and he brought his suit and we all saw it. We were just heads down finding stuff. And look back, he is looking fantastic leaving and we're all like well, what's going on here <laughs> where, where are you going we're still working <laughs> he was gone he was like yeah well you need to find that and put it on my desk because in the morning I'm gonna need it I didn't find it till late late god it was late and I was just like I don't I I would never have realized I didn't want to do that <laughs> you okay. know what I mean yes so yeah it, mentors do a lot of things for you 
Um, we need people who are going to show us the truth. And, you know, if we have talent, we need to know that. We need to know it. If we're right. lacking in some places, we need to know that. We need to know it. If we are unrealistic about our expectations, we need to have those expectations set right. And we can't always do that ourselves. So, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a mentor that seems like they're really hard on you, sit back and pay attention for a second. There's a reason. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a very good point. I mean, now, I will ask um, along those same lines, how do you know when the person is being hard on you because they're trying to bring the best out of you or they're being hard on you because they're just negative? I don't think you always do. I didn't know why he was being so rough on me at the time. It took me years. I, I'm I was out of his class and not even dealing with him. I didn't, hadn't graduated quite yet, but I was beyond where his level class left. You know, I was up further in and I it dawned on me. I'm like, yeah, I don't like this. And that's why I knew this. And I could make this decision to not continue because I, I already learned this lesson. And I actually went back to him. Sometimes you have these enlightening moments where you're just like, oh, I, ding, I've got it. So I went back and I told him, he says, I know. I tried to tell you, you weren't listening. So I showed you. I'm like, yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> totally right. You don't always know. And I think we all run into people who have, are being negative and negativity comes from a lot of different places, right? There's jealousy. There's just, there's wanting to gate, be a gatekeeper. There's um, pride. There is, you know, all the, all sorts of things that rope them together and make a new animal, you know? And we're not always going to know why someone saying something to us. But it's, what's important as the individual being spoken to or shown something is that we see it all. Just like when we're having, we're writing and we hand over our paper for a writing critique or you know, even when you print, you know, publish a book and hand it over to the public to read. Um, you use the feedback that's useful for you and useful to you and you yeah. cast the rest aside. That's absolutely right. Now I will say that, um... When I wrote my dissertation, I felt that my SME, my subject matter expert, was um, negative, and I felt that she was trying to poke holes in my argument. Mm. And at first, I got upset about it, and I said, why is she even my subject matter expert anyway? She's not a real subject matter expert, and I got an attitude. Mm -hmm. But then I sat down, and I thought about it, and I said, you know, I'm just going to take this as a challenge, yeah. and I can convince her that my argument has merit, then um, I can convince anybody that That's my right. argument has merit. That's so right. um, I agree with what you said about um, trying to find the truth in what anybody is actually saying. And yeah, there are gonna be times where you can take away the positive from it. And there are some times where you're gonna to have to leave the bones, mm -hmm. but, um, but always value any feedback that you get. That's right. And that's hard to say, it's hard to, to feel, you know, it's hard to stomach when somebody, especially when you don't know where it's coming from, people are allowed to have their thoughts. And we're putting this work out here. We can't think it's always going to be roses, right? I mean, um, so we have to take the good with the bad, but, and that's thick skin. And I, I hate when people say, oh, you have to get thick skin because you don't really get thick skin. It always, it always touches you in some way. <laughs> some way reviews you horribly. You're just like, oh, you know, but um Honestly, sometimes we're too, we're too deep in. We can't see the, the forest for the trees, to quote an old saying, right? And if we can't see something that someone from a different experience, uh, their background, et cetera, they can see clear as a bell and we really never see it, then that's valuable information. Now, what we want to do with it is what we choose to do with it. But if you never knew it, now you have it. And it doesn't matter if it's coming to you from a malicious standpoint or not. You have to hear what it is and move on. Amen to that. Yeah. yeah, you know, people, they say you have to have a thick skin, but when you write and you put it out there, writing is, is personal. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's like art, any art, somebody critiquing your work. Now, and you put your best out there. I mean, most people don't just put garbage out there. Right. They put out there what, what they believe they want to say. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's help. The feedback is helpful, but sometimes you, you just present it the way you want to, and you just have to say, people have to accept it or not, or read it or not, or whatever. Mm -hmm. so not everybody's going to like what you put out there. 
Right, no, and the story has to come out the way it comes out. Right. And it's difficult as an author, especially a new author, when they don't know how, because we weigh our worth in someone's you know, opinion of us, right? Um, and we put this piece out here, we want it to be accepted so that we can have another chance to put something else out, or we want to be successful with the thing we've done already. And it can be really difficult to stand by your own, you know, thoughts and say, this is how I meant to write it. This is what I, this is the message I'm putting there. Right, right. And, you know, it's not if you don't like it, so what, but. This is what I'm trying to convey. You right. know, what did, I, I wonder how people were able to get feedback before we had reviews, before the internet. You know, yeah. I did, I wasn't a writer. I, my first book came out the end of 2007. Mm -hmm. So, but in the pre-internet world, when people had books, I wonder how they even found out if people like, like maybe they wrote letters. Maybe they got letters in the mail. You had, well, you, of course you had your newspaper reviews, right? But you would get fan mail where that's not such a thing anymore. Social right. media, media is the fan mail it's now. A fan people mail. would literally right. mail, I mean, you know, letters to music artists and mm -hmm. authors mm -hmm. and that's how they would find out. But sometimes, you know, people do some really... So just like social media, people can do some truly horrible things. Like if you go and critique my book, you read it, you don't like it. Okay, that's fair. You don't have to like it, but the personal attack is right. Why? Right. Why is that necessary? Right. And or a threat, for goodness sakes. Those are the things that always really just I never understand. Um, those are the things I think that people really have never checked themselves on. I don't think anyone's, you know, since we decided we, we have the right to reach out to people and say whatever we want to say, people <laughs> have felt they can be yeah, cruel. And they do it. And, and be, be, be cruel or mean or threatening, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or, or uh, in some, some cases, uh, I really haven't had much of this, but even, even questioning your intellect or, or. Uh, questioning your your methodology in writing, uh, why you did it the way you did it? Well, because you wanted to do it that way. That's the answer. <laughs> That's exactly right. Oh, God, that question always drives me. Like, what do you think? Why, why do you Why do you think I did it that? I don't know. It was a mistake. I, I don't know. I, know I did it. <laughs> Thanks for telling me. <laughs> right, right. Now I, I know we're running out of time, but I did want to read a comment to you um, from Stephanie Burnham. She wants to know what, which horror element or creature in literature or films consistently gives you chills. For her, it was reading about voodoo witches and reading the horrors of Marie Delphine Lalaurie, a depraved slave owner. Um, Madame Lalaurie is from Louisiana. Her mansion still stands in mm -hmm. New Orleans. Yeah, I read about that. That scared me silly. And not because of a horror thing. That's just terrifying that just humans could behave that right. way. Right. Um, you know, I love vampires, but they actually don't scare me, which is like, you know, weird, but they don't, I just kind of like them. I think that they present this visual or this embodiment of like <laughs> being other and it's okay. I kind of love them. I really do. But the thing that does scare me, and this is not, this is going to be interesting. And I, 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 I challenge you all to look this one up. So if you've seen the ring, the movie, the ring, or you've seen uh, the Grudge. These are mid two thousands movies. That long haired girl, the ghost that they're showing in that, is a, a depiction of the Unroyu. That is a Japanese, I think it's yeah, Japanese ghost of a woman who's been wronged, and she's come she's come back for revenge. Ooh. In every single movie that she's in, I'm terrified. I have two books on my shelf right now that I need to read, and I'm afraid. <laughs> She is because of, here's the reason. You know, I I connected with her through my own fear, because what happens is when she gets the opportunity to exact revenge, she's she's merciless. She's truly merciless, and she doesn't really care who's in the way. And what I what bothers me is that no one ever in these movies, at least, no one has ever tried to figure out what's the root of her problem. When you do hear her backstory, it's kind of pushed, you know, away. But she is she is at, at, at times raped at times beaten by her husband and killed at times her child is killed sure she's angry <laughs> sure she's coming back like that <laughs> so i have at every turn been frightened by this character now it's now you know the american versions of the movies i'll give you ringu which is the japanese version of the ring 
Mm. I'll give you Juwan. Juwan one is good, but Juwan two is scarier. And that's another version of this woman, uh, the, the grudge version, uh, you know, the original. And I'll give you, uh, which one will I pick? Shutter, S-H-U-T-T-E-R. There is an American version. Watch the Thai version. Oh, so you something. watch all kinds of horror international. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm hearing from you. <laughs> I do. I do. Okay. Uh, to be honest, I think when you're when you're studying your craft and when you're doing your work, you have to read broadly and watch broadly. I mean, I, I write screenplays too, so I watch all sorts of stuff and I read okay. all sorts of stuff. And that allows me to, you know, stretch my own legs. Mm. Okay. So remind us what your latest book is so so our viewers can can go get a copy of it or download it. Thank you. That would be awesome. Um, The newest thing is the combination set of the Tales of Time and the open book. And you can find that anywhere the books are sold. Okay. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. We've we've had a horror two weeks in a row. And yeah, I'm learning. I'm learning. And and I'm, I'm going to start reading some books. Hopefully they won't make me scared. Gwen, we're bringing you over <laughs> our side. <laughs> I can see Thank you for having me. Have this have a <laughs> I can see myself reading one of your scary books. My boyfriend will walk into the room. I'm going to scream because I'm going to forget that there were other people in the house. That, that will happen. That will happen. <laughs> if that happens, please email me and let me know. That would be so fun. <laughs> Okay, well, El Marie, thank you so much for being a guest on Black Authors Matter TV and continued success with all of your writing, the screenwriting and this book writing and everything. Thank you both for having me. Have a wonderful night. You too. Okay, so before we announce the finalists for the Black Authors Matter TV Awards, we are going to give away the two, three copies of uh, Love, Honor, Betray, which is the latest book by Mary Monroe. It just came out last week. So uh, we have three questions we're going to be asking for the audience to win a copy. And these are autographs. She autographed the books. So you get an autographed copy. So the first question is, and this is the third book in a series. So this is about the series overall. Hubert Wiggins and his first wife, Maggie, had a son. What was his name? So that's trivia question number one for the series. Uh, This is the final book, Love, Honor, Betray. The first one was Mrs. Wiggins. And the second one was, I always forget the second one, but it's it's three books. (laughs) So let me see if it's in here, if it's stated on here somewhere uh empty vows empty vows book two so what is their son's name the next one is what was hubert's profession hubert wiggins had a profession what did he do for his day job every day so um the answer to that that's number two and number three what's the title of mary monroe's book that became her first best seller so Rhonda has put the questions in the chat and she is going to monitor to let me know who wins a copy of the book. I'm watching. Okay, so we're going to now announce our finalists for the, this year's Black Authors Matter TV Awards. And there are 15 categories. You all voted. We had about 1,500 ballots come in. So um Congratulations to those who or nominees and people who've been on the show for a 12-month period automatically get put in the nomination process. But then it gets winnowed down to five finalists in each category based on votes. So we're going to start with the biography memoir category. And the five finalists for that category are Sonia Curry. Karen Dixon Brown, Boya Hara, Lisa McNair, and Frederick Douglas Reynolds. So those are the five finalists in the biography memoir category. 
and uh, Rhonda's going to have some color commentary after each, uh, after two, when we do two, we'll do two categories, and then she can give us some color commentary. Um, the next category is children's, and we have 15 categories, and sometimes there, there were a lot of people in the categories, and sometimes there were a limited number. The main, the main criteria for creating the category, it had to be at least five people who were interviewed, and that was their primary category during the interview, the primary subject matter. So some authors who came on the show were not interviewed as authors. They may have been interviewed in some other capacity, publisher, um, some, some, an agent. We have some that were even agents or bookstore owners or book club presidents. So whatever capacity they were on the show to discuss during the interview, that's what category they were in. And if we didn't have at least five, we combined some categories. So you'll, when we keep going, you'll hear combinations of categories. So the next one is children's. So in the ch children's category, the finalists are Nana Akua Brew Hammond, uh, Zaria Cherry, mm -hmm. Black Diamond, Ada Ari Conquo and Dominique Conquo. They're not related and they didn't, they weren't co-authors. I don't think they're related. I think they just have the same last name. Yeah. So because one of them it was her her ex-husband's name. So I don't so I don't think they were related. But anyway, those are the five children's uh, authors. Congratulations. So you have any any surprises so far? Um, did, did you think, Rhonda, and um, as far as who made the list so far? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say surprises because these were some great interviews. Um, I, I always love to see so many people in the children's authors category um, because- And a lot. Yeah, I mean, but because, I mean, of course I'm not a child. I don't have a baby anymore. But I love children's books because I, um, they're always so beautifully illustrated. And um, I've noticed that there's a trend toward teaching lessons while still keeping kids kids, um, not trying to make the lesson too mature. Um, so they still have so they can still enjoy the story. So I like I like that about our children's authors. Yeah, we had about 20, I think. I mean, I'm just get I'm not I don't have the exact number, but I'm gonna say about 20 children's authors that were on the show for over a year's time. So those are the five finalists. So our next category is Christian fiction. And the finalists in this category are Dr. Velma Bagby, Ooh. Rashonda Tate Billingsley, Ooh. Sharon Elise. I can't do that woohoo for everybody. So just, <laughs> just think that's for everybody. Yeah, Pat. <laughs> Pat, now you have to correct me. I never can remember how this is pronounced. I'm going to say Pat George Walker. But when she was on the show, she said it wasn't George. It was something else. George Day George, George George or something. I, I can't recall. But Pat Walker, you made the finals. And Vanessa, <laughs> Vanessa Miller, those are the five finalists in Christian fiction. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So next we have, we combine comic books, graphic novels, poetry, and young adult fiction into one category. I can't believe we had um, interviewed so many graphic novelists. Well, this, this was comic books, graphic novels, poetry, and young adult fiction. That's so I think we had 12 or so, I think, all together. But we did have more graphic novelists than we've had in the past. Right. Some of these categories are like up and coming, you know, more it's more young adult fiction being published. Um, and the comic books and graphic novels, they're growing categories. So so the five finalists in, the, in that category are Christian Cook, Rita Williams Garcia, Pamela Harris, Regina Jennings, and Stephanie Perry more. Wonderful. So congratulations to those. So 
Our next category is, before I continue, do we have any winners in the of the book? Let me check, because I was too busy looking at the list. <laughs> no, no winners yet. Nobody won. Okay, all right. No winners for the book. And I'll, I may say the questions again before the end of the show. Okay, the next category is fantasy. We combine fantasy, mystery, sci-fi, and suspense into one category. So the finalists in that category are Stephen Barnes. That's uh, Tanana Reduce's husband. She was on uh, earlier in the show. Megan Giddings, Brandon Massey, Deborah McDaniel, and Gary Phillips. Nice. So those are the finalists. And and um, I met Deborah at the Zeta conference. Um, she was with us there at the Zeta uh, Boule mm -hmm. in Philadelphia last summer. We had a. Um, she is a Zeta. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, she's the Zeta. The Zeta. I didn't realize that. I just thought she was there with her book. Okay. So that's that's that category. Next, we have historical fiction slash romance. Well, so. Category. Yeah, we have um a good 15 authors in this category. So the five finalists for that, you know, a lot of historical fiction came out this year, the well, last well over the past year, and more coming out in, in future months. I think I feel like it's a growing um a genre like like Afrofuturism and fantasy and sci-fi, those are really, really taking off. Um, among black authors. So, so the five finalists in historical fiction romance are Angela Jackson Brown, Piper Hugley, Beverly Jenkins, All right. Wanda Morris, and Vanessa Riley. No surprises in that category. No, and that that was a very competitive category in um the finalists the five finalists all had really uh, some books that got a lot of recognition yes all right the next category is history so we had historical fiction this category is history it's actual history so we had 10 we had 10 authors in that category and the five finalists for that one are alvin hall he had the book Driving the Green Book. I thought that was a, that was a good thing. He drove, he drove across the places and stopped at places where the Green Book had, had them listed, the, the travel guide that Black people used to use. So Alvin Hall, the next one is Michael Rashawn Hall. They're not related as far as I know. <laughs> I think Michael was the one who had the book because history stays on my mind. I really love history. I think he had the book based on postcards. You remember that he did a whole book based oh. on postcards from the past that he had collected because that's people would travel and they always send postcards. And I thought that was fascinating. Claude Johnson, he had the book, The, the Black Fives about basketball in the 1920s. I'm not gonna remember everybody, but. Uh, <laughs> what everybody had you know when you interview a lot of people you can't retain them all mm -hmm. and um, Francesca Royster her book was about black country music her her interview was recent I and, remember. Mm -hmm. Candace C. Taylor is the final um, the last finalist for that category so those are the finalists in the history category next we have Mainstream fiction. And mainstream mainstream fiction. Anybody win the books yet? No. Uh, check. I'm sitting here looking at the list. No. Uh, Karen Dixon Brown, I think, just logged on. And Karen, I wanted to let you know you were a finalist in the biography memoir category. So if, if you missed it, the announcement, then I wanted to let you know that you were a finalist. Um, mainstream fiction is the next category. Connie Briscoe, Nina Fox, 
Nalela, Nalela Kai, mm -hmm. Mary Monroe, and Kennedy Ryan. That's going to be a pretty competitive category. Yeah, this, yeah, it is. So those are the five finalists. There were 10 authors interviewed in mainstream fiction. So next, let's see, the next category is motivational, inspirational. So we had, uh, I want to say 15 or so motivational authors and the finalists are Stephanie Jackson, Dr. Bisa Batten Lewis, Calinthia Miller, Brian W. Smith, and Dorinda Walker. Those are the finalists in Motivational Inspirational. So, Rhonda, what, I, I didn't hear you. I said Brian W. Smith, he won the first year we did the contest. Yeah, yes, he, but he won in, in a fiction. I think it was mainstream fiction or it wasn't urban. He doesn't do urban no. fiction. Well, he doesn't do urban fiction. Yeah. But his latest book was motivational. That's when he was on the interview. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing. Some people, they write in different genres. So when they're interviewed about their latest book, they could be in a different genre than the one that they were in previously if, they, if it's a second or follow-on interview. So, okay, next we have nonfiction. Nonfiction is kind of the category that it's, it doesn't, it's, a, it's not fiction and it doesn't fit in the other categories right. that are not fiction. So uh, nonfiction has, I think 12 people interviewed and the five finalists in nonfiction are Jesse and Alfred Brinkley, Dr. Dana Jones Meggett, Daphne Maxwell Reed, mm -hmm. Bernard Sims, and Dana Spencer. So those are the five finalists in the nonfiction category. I believe Stephanie Jackson. She's uh, watching. Oh, she said, thank you so very much. You're welcome. These are based on votes from the public. And we had about 1,500 ballots that were cast. So, and a lot of, a lot of people voted. Some people only voted for one person and some people voted for in all the 15 categories. Some people only voted for one person, the person they were supporting. So, and every, it's all allowed. So, um, Next, we have politics, public policy, social studies. That's all one category. Okay. And the finalists in that category are Venice Berry, Dr. Leslie Fenwick, Minda Hartz, Willie Tolliver, and Cynthia Tucker. Now, what I remember the most about Venice Berry was the one who did a, a screen share and she was showing us advertising and how the images. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like how images will tell the story. Either we're included or we're excluded. Or if we're included, it's, it's like a message and it's normally negative. <laughs> she was showing us that on the screen. Willie Tolliver, he's the one that did the book about Will Smith right after the slap. Like his book came out right before the slap. Oh, and yeah. And in the book, he had a chapter called The Slap Heard Around the World that wasn't even about that slap. So he said that book really, he saw a lot of, it's the timing. The timing was just um, amazing. And Cynthia Tucker, she had been on, uh, she used to be on TV a lot you know, when she worked for the Atlanta Journal Constitution and she had a, a book that came out. So, congrats, but congratulations to all the finalists. I've just, some of the ones I, I remember because either they were recent or something happened that made me remember. But we've all, we've interviewed almost 500 people on this show, 500 different people since we started this show. So not every interview is like at the front of my mind, but every interview 
is saved in our Facebook video archive. So you can always go back and look at any of these interviews at any time. The next category is religious. Oh, go back and look at these interviews and you'll see why they were nominated and then you'll get to vote for your winners. Right, right. We're going to tell you the rest of the schedule after we finish naming all of the people. And then you'll get to vote again. So you get to vote once for the finalist round. And then after that, you get to vote again for the winners. So um, the next category is religious faith. And the um, finalists are Daryl Hall, Dr. Vernette C. Nettles, Charlene Rogers, Dr. E. Taylor, and Cheryl Wills. So those are the um, people in the religious faith category. Cheryl Wills had that book called Isn't Her Grace Amazing? Um, the one with the gospel women gospel singers. Mm -hmm. And the reason that comes to my mind is because my, I have a uh, longtime customer who ordered like five of those for different people. Or as holiday gifts. So that was that was, you know, she she didn't hear about it. She 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 doesn't have a computer. She's an older lady. But I told her about it. Then she ordered one and then she loved it. And then she ordered multiples for other people. So um the next category is urban fiction. And the five finalists in that category are Tracy Brown. Ill One, that's his uh, pseudonym that he goes by, Ill One. Quan, Keith Thomas Walker, and Keith Kareem Williams. So those are the finalists in urban fiction. All men. Well, wait a minute. Not Tracy. No, except for Tracy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Except for Tracy. So next we have bookstores. And for those of you all who watch the show, we will interview bookstore owners from time to time. And we had, a, we had quite a few, how many did we have? 12, 13. We had 13 bookstores owners that we interviewed from March of last year to March of this year. And so the five finalists in that category are Jeff, Jeffrey Blair of the I See Me Children's Bookstore. Janine A. Cook with Harriet's Bookshop. Danielle and Gabriel Davenport with BEM Books and More. Malik Muhammad with Malik Books. And Raven White of Brown Sugar Cafe and Books. Now I can remember, well, I know Janine Cook of Harriet's Bookshop was in Philadelphia and she was the one that rode the horse to deliver books during COVID. <laughs> and we had a picture of her on the front of the newspaper riding her horse. That, you know, hey, that that's like free publicity and lots of attention. I mean, she really wanted to get those books there. Yeah. Um, uh, Danielle and Gabriel Davenport, they had the bookstore they were starting about food. All their books were food related either recipe books or the storyline was about food and they were sisters. So um, Malik Muhammad, was he in California? He had had his bookstore a long time. That's, I remember him. I think he was in California. I can't remember where he was. Me either. And Raven White, her bookstore is in Katy, Texas. Yeah, which I heard um, is coming back. Her book, is it coming back? I've heard. Okay, because I know she closed for a time. And um, so if she comes back, that would be great. Yeah, because I'm be wonderful. Uh, so the final category is a big one. It's called book in industry support. And this category includes people who are not authors or bookstores. <laughs> so everybody else we interview, some of them are. They have a Facebook group related to books. They might be publishers. They might be agents. Uh, they might have a event, a literary event, um, book clubs, anybody who's supporting the industry, but they're not an author 
for a bookstore. So the five finalists in this category are Shea Baby with Br the Brown Book Series, Justin Batt of Frederick Douglass Books, Yvette Hennington, with, who's Vice President of the Driven Divas Book Club, Sharon Lucas with Black Authors Rock Weekend in Baltimore. She does that event every year. And she's also in a book club, but she came, She comes on uh, regarding her event. And the final one is Julia Royston of BK Royston Publishing. So those are all of the finalists for this year's Black Authors Matter TV Awards. Let's give them a hand. Yay! And also congratulations to Mary Evans who got one of the questions correct. Okay, Mary, which which one was it? Um, she said Claude. Claude was correct. The son. Yes. The son of Maggie and Hubert. So let me put Mary's name down. And then I'm gonna go over the schedule for um the rest of the okay. upcoming voting. Before you do that, we have another correct answer. Okay, let me get Mary so I can so before I forget. Mary Evans, okay. Who was the other one? Um, Miss Queenie Clem. She said funeral owner. That's correct. Queenie Clem. Okay, so we have one more question that hasn't been answered yet. And so you still have time. We still have five minutes or so, four minutes or so. Left. Well, yes. Um I think Mary got that one too, but well, um, you can only win one of the autographed books. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's not fair for you to win two. And we have to carry on till next week. We'll just keep carrying on till we give the rest of them away. So um, so the finalists were announced tonight. The next round of voting for the winners. So each of these five finalists in 15 categories will be on a ballot and you'll be voting for the winners for if it's one winner in each category. So the voting for that starts April 10th, which is Monday, next Monday. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was looking at the calendar, yeah, it is Monday. And the voting closes April 28th. So you have 18 days or so to vote for your favorite in each category. The voting will start at midnight, so 12 o'clock 12 on the 10th, and it'll end at 11.59, because we have the, the ballots timed. So they turn off, they turn on and they turn off the, those times. April 28th at 11.59 will be the last time to vote. As, as in this process, you can vote every day um, from uh, one IP address. So you can do one submission per day per IP address. So you can do, um, you can vote from your laptop or your cell phone. I think they, they should be on two different IP addresses mm -hmm. or your tablet. So, uh, and you can vote for yourself if you're one of the finalists. You can encourage people to vote for you. We will have a video ready by the end of the week with all of the finalists, um, pictures and their names and the categories. And we'll post it on social media. You'll be able to share that with your friends and, and family. And it'll have a link to the voting. So people can look at the video and vote. And we'll be um, circulating that for the entire voting period. Then after the 28th, the votes will be counted and the award show is May 16th. And as you know, we do, it's just like, like the um, Grammys or the Academy Awards. We have a really nice intro. We have entertainment. Um, we open the envelopes. We have, we, we name them and everybody's on the screen. It's a lot of fun. So those are, that's related to the uh, Black Office Matter TV Awards. Congratulations again to all the finalists. And um, the, only other, the only other two things I wanna mention are our book club kickbacks 
We've already scheduled the next two ones on June 13. We'll be reading Connie Briscoe's new book, You Never Know. That was released March 14th. September 5th, we'll be reading Victoria Christopher Murray's new book, The First Ladies, and that's released June 27th. But we have the holidays in there, so we want to give people time to buy it and read it. And so those are our kickbacks. And of course, for our kickbacks, the authors are on the screen for the discussion. If you're in a book club, you'll start getting an email about the first one soon. So that's it for this week. We had a lot going on tonight. Yeah. We did get an answer to the third question. It okay. It, I'm looking for her name because I lost it. Um, <laughs> there's so many, so many um, messages. Deborah Kaiser. She said, God don't like ugly. That's correct. Yes. Now, um, there is one that I need to check, and I may not be able to check it until we finish the show, so we may have to contact them. But okay. Veronica Bossman, Lady DeBar, um, um, she, may, she may have answered before Mary, so I just need to look at the timestamps. Okay. See. Well, we'll respond on the, as a reply on the page. So we're at nine o'clock and it's time for us to go. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is Black Authors Matter TV and I'm Gwen Richardson signing off. And I'm Dr. Rhonda Lawson. Have a wonderful evening and a great week. Thank you for tuning in and join us next Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern for another edition of Black Authors Matter TV.